Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your wonderful word, for the gift of redeeming us by the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we might be redeemed to our purpose of singing your praises, of bringing you glory. Please, Lord, in this time of study, might your name be lifted up, might you be glorified amongst us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, so today we get to talk about uh, an important topic. Of course, you know, we study, generally tend to study verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the Word of God for the very important purpose that you don't need to know what's on my heart, you need the full counsel of God. And this way, your teaching elders and pastors don't have the freedom to just skip over the things they don't want to talk about or they don't uh, find particularly interesting. But we do get to talk about something that was never controversial in church history before and now has become rather controversial on a number of levels. Certainly, the world always disagrees with or argues or stands against God's moral ideas about his creation of marriage and also about the general idea and meaning and importance of singleness. And so we're dealing with a whole lot of uh, challenges and things that we'll have to mention. In fact, I'll say things that I've noticed that I've never had to notice before because we've never seen the, the, quite this level of opposition or desire to pervert or ruin or destroy or stand against God's perfect uh, plan and creation and institution of marriage. So, as we go into 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we'll see that we'll uh, take up the next three weeks, this week and two others, of study, and it'll give us a chance to kind of open up and look at what the Bible has to say as a whole about these issues. So, first of all, today we get to talk about marriage and singleness, which hopefully will bring about some new insights for you, or if not, reinforce some important ideas about these things. Um, we'll talk about the issue of divorce in 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 24. Again, another controversial issue to be sure, but we're just going to hit it head on and say this is what the Bible has to say on the matter. Uh, finally, we're going to, I've titled the lesson in advance, Serve Where You Are, but talking about contentment, contentment in whatever cir circumstance you might find yourself and how to glorify God wherever you're at, at which will bring about the best uh, end uh, or purpose uh, and expression of God's life and mercy and grace and glory in your life. So that's 1 Corinthians 7, 25 through 40. So now you've kind of got an update or a preview on what's coming ahead. And today we get to look at 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 9, and we're going to look at this in three different more topical sections, but it also uh, arranges by, as it comes out in Scripture. So first of all, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 poses the big question, and we're going to see that there's some controversy simply with the question alone, or at least some misunderstanding. It's actually quite plain once you read it and understand it, but prior to that, it can be a little tough. Next, we're going to talk about the gift of marriage in 1 Corinthians 7, 2 through 6. Uh, unfortunately, we will not have time to go through everything that the Bible says about marriage. It is one of the most important things or features of human life and the way God created us to be. And your marriage is deadly important to what God is doing here on this planet if you are married. It is important to how He wants to see His gospel, His truth, His life, His love uh, lived out. The family is God's primary building block that He created for society. So hopefully, if nothing else, we can point you to some other important resources as well as opportunities for marriage counseling or premarital counseling if that's a direction you're heading. Um, but we'll look very, again, very briefly today at, at all of that and hopefully open the door. And finally, we'll get to look at the gift of singleness, an often overlooked uh, gift, an often overlooked situation in the church at large, much to our shame. In fact, as we see as we go throughout church history, there's sort of a back and forth or bungee cord type swing between favoring marriage and favoring unmarriedness and both cause error, both devaluing marriage for one way or the other or um, devaluing singleness in the ministry of single people within the church. So we begin by examining this important question in verse 1. It says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So, is this possibly what Paul could be saying? Could he possibly be saying that marriage is bad? That marriage is, that in fact, there should be no uh, physical intimacy between any Christians, particularly between men and women, that even such a thing as, you know, giving a, a woman a handshake or maybe the Christian side hug of fellowship, maybe that's sin as well? No, of course he can't be saying that. 
Paul is actually here uh, responding. And remember, we, we spoke last week or two weeks ago about some of the difficulties of translation. And that's that the Greek text does not have the amount of uh, punctuation that, that is there. So we have to look to the grammar and the words and the context to come up with what is actually being uh, communicated here. And what's being communicated here, much like in the last chapter, when Paul said very suspiciously, that all things are permissible or all things are lawful when we knew that there were certain things that were not permissible and certain things that were not lawful based upon the character of God and the evil and wickedness of sin, right? What was he doing? Well, then he was quoting one of the expressions, one of the memes, one of the ideas that was going around in the, in the Corinthian church. The idea being that Jesus Christ had paid for all sin, therefore they could do whatever they wanted, right? They'd come to that, and he specifically rebuked that. Similarly, but not identically here, he's answering another question. So while you have one group of people who say that absolutely any sexual malfeasance is absolutely acceptable and fine, and they're going to applaud it, it seems there's another group in the church that's writing, shouldn't we just not marry at all? Isn't the time short? Shouldn't nobody marry, and we just stay on mission and stay on point and throw everything else to the wind? because Jesus could return at any moment. And so Paul's going to bring balance to this discussion and ultimately, hopefully, bring that same balance to our lives. So there may have been, or, or as we see, as in any church, there were going to be legalistic people and licentious people. There are going to be those who fall down on one side of Scripture and want to uh, trend towards their own pleasure, their own desires, and ignore, ig ignorance or ignoring God's Word. And there's going to be legalists who are going to be adding on and making new prohibitions and new rules and new expectations that are not in God's Word. And both wind us up in a self-centered, self-focused train wreck of the faith. Uh, it could also be, though, we have to admit that they're overreacting to Paul's previous advice. He'd already written to them prior to this epistle about sexual immorality, so it could be that some of them were essentially taking what he clearly meant for them to understand, depart from sexual morality, don't let that be a part of the church, and certainly don't let it be glorified in the church, and said, well, then should we just do away with physical intimacy altogether? And so he's responding to these over-rotations, and it is important to recognize that, as has been well said before, that humanity, like a drunk man on a horse having fallen off one side, is sure to fall off the other side in just a moment's time. It's quite true. And so we're, at, we're, we're dealing with all of these kind of human and sinful responses to what God has reviewed or revealed about this. And so now, Paul, interestingly, almost without... Uh, without provocation, right? Because really the question is that they've asked is about sexual intimacy or appears to be about intimacy. intimacy. But he instead points out the one place where sexual intimacy is prescribed by God and allowed by God. So in so doing, he is enforcing this reality that God designed humans to have sexual relationships only within the confines of a marriage between a man and a woman. And so when talking about how is that appropriately to be expressed, that need, that desire, need, that desire to be appropriately expressed uh, within the life of a person, and so he brings up a familiar institution to all of them, which is the divine institution of marriage. We call this the second divine institution. As God is creating the heavens and the earth, creating this world and ordering it, there are certain things that he instituted man to do, humanity, that is, to do. The first is responsible dominion. That is to say that he gave humanity, men and women together, a responsibility to take care of his, uh, to take care of his creation. That, that was our design, to be fruitful and multiply, to care for the fish and the birds and the trees, and ultimately uh, make the beauty and productivity of that sinless world extend to its very uh, edges. The second divine institution in Genesis 2, 18 through 24, comes upon God's reflection that it is not good for man to be alone. So Genesis chapter 1, of course, sort of details the greater picture of creation. And Genesis chapter 2 is like God opening a text box or, or perhaps, uh, you know, like a special focus on day 6 and the creation of man. And when he creates 
Adam first, he creates him alone, and uh, he gives him this dominion over the world and then makes the observation that it is not good for him to be alone and thus creates uh, uh, Eve out of his side, right, and creates her to be a partner for him and also the completion of him so that they could complete his will. In other words, they could not, or Adam alone could not do what he was supposed to do according to God's plan. He couldn't be fruitful and multiply alone. And so when Adam, and through the kind of illustrative or teaching uh, situation of, of God, when he marches all the animals past Adam and, and he names them, and he sees, hey, there's a guy and a girl. There's a guy and a girl. That, why, there's only one of me. And God's like, I got your back. Well, actually, your side. And I'm going to make that into something uh, equivalent to you, something comparable to you, someone who is going to be a, a partner for you, right? God designed us to relate in this fashion. And it's difficult because God, it can be a little bit difficult because God created marriage and gave it to all humanity, but He never gave us a procedure as to what constitutes or defines a person that is married. Some have suggested that maybe it just resides in the, physic, the act of physical intimacy, but that cannot be the case because we see examples of people. Um, engaging in that and yet not being referred to or thought of as married by any stretch. In fact, it would be almost impossible to have an adulterous relationship or any kind of sexual morality in that regard because it just everybody would be married to everybody else. It would be awkward. So that one doesn't quite pull it, although we see that that's a part of the equation. I think drawing from the larger picture of Scripture, we can see three major things. One, there needs to be a declaration of mutual intent. In other words, both people need to decide that they want to get married. A public commitment seems to be an important trend throughout Scripture. And finally, that act of consummation after that public commitment. So if you're going to break it down to three minimum things to say a person was married, and notice I did not say a particular certificate before the government. That happens with your individual government and, and all that goes. But ultimately, marriage is God's institution to define what is and what it isn't. And that is where uh, the primary commitment lies is before uh, the Lord. And I think it's important that we recognize that God did not uh, give us any specific requirements as to what constitutes a marriage, because God seemingly honors all marriages between a man and a woman. It doesn't matter. When Paul comes onto a, uh, you know, into the early church and the Gentile pagan nations and starts to talk about husbands and wives, he doesn't say, hey, if you got married at, you know, in a Gentile or a pagan circumstance, you need to redo that. No. God honored that marriage, even though they were married under pagan or, or uh, wicked circumstances. Even things that are less than ideal, such as, uh, well, well, we'll look at different uh, styles or things that come up in the marriage equation. But to point out that God, because He created marriage, honors even the cultural expectations surrounding what those, uh, what sort of uh, auspices might surround uh, what constitutes that marital commitment, uh, and that's valuable. That's important. It shows that that those marriage that marriage is again a thing that God reveres and designed for all humanity. So it binds all humanity uh, and is defined only by God. We see that marriage is uh, adorned by Christ's first miracle, John 1 or 2, 1 through 12. Jesus' first miracle of turning water into wine happened where? At a wedding. And while it was certainly a miracle that it displayed his goodness, and there's so much we can take from that, we see that he came to a wedding and just didn't want it to go off the rails. He didn't want a wedding to be ruined because, again, it was a thing that God had designed. It was a good thing uh, that was around. It was affirmed by Christ repeatedly as between a man and a woman. He only spoke about it in those terms, uh, I think, intentionally. And finally, an il it is an illustration of Christ and the church. And uh, if you want to write down one major passage that you need to look at alongside this one, you need to look at Ephesians 5, 22 through 33, which we may get to revisit several times, but it is in that section that we see that marriage, Christian marriage especially, is meant to reflect the love between Christ and the church and the life that exists between Christ and the church that he saved. And that is, if you want to know what the point of marriage, it's not to be happy, it's not to make finances easier, it's not for the tax break, it is because we have an opportunity to reflect God's life and God's love with our every moment as a married couple. That's the design. 
So, as we look at these uh, verses quickly with that preview in mind, or sorry, no, no, we did that. Okay, good. Here's the point that, that we want to draw. Marriage is very good. Marriage is God's design. Marriage is a wonderful thing. It could be a difficult thing. It could be a challenging thing. You take two people with two sin natures and bind them together, and boy, trouble's bound to occur. But God still designs us to live within that union, and it is far uh, better than the alternative, not the alternative of singleness. It's better than the alternative of trying to live with someone in some other modern arrangement. God designed us to be committed to one single other person and enjoy that union and that unity alone at the exclusion of all others, and it is very good. And this is one of those faith moments because the world has plenty of other ideas that it will offer about how relationships between men and women can work whether that's the, the vile and disgusting hookup culture of today or the just live together and try it out culture uh, that, that people will often put forward. None of those things live up to God's ultimate design of two people united to one another and committed to one another. Marriage is very good, and it does not get the shake that it deserves in modern culture. Not surprisingly, right? They're blinded by sin. They're blinded by the world. But we see in the Bible that marriage is the best way, in fact, the only way that God adorns and ordains for uh, mankind to live uh, as, as a man and a woman together and the basis of the family. But also, singleness is very good. We come terrifyingly and terribly to this situation that churches, for whatever reason, I think I suspect that I'm talking about modern American churches now or modern Western churches and probably elsewhere, there's sort of a, a good feeling that you get when the uh, children's ministry is full and, and when you see lots of happy mommies and daddies and children walking around, and that's good, right? It is a good thing, previous, as you all previously noted. And what can often happen is that can make single people feel as if they're second rate or somehow play second fiddle to the ultimate goal, which is the endless string of marriage classes or family classes or child rearing classes or whatever it is, and feel like, well, here I am just a single person. So much so that many churches will have a singles ministry that is really just low key a chance to date somebody who's a Christian, right? And that's a problem. Because that suggests that one of God's ordained ways to go through this life, that is to say in singleness, which all of us will enjoy for some or experience for some uh, period of time in our life, either before marriage or, or certainly throughout our whole life potentially, or uh, maybe if your spouse you know, passes on, singleness is a very good thing. And that's what we're going to get to look at in today's message. But I want to point this out right up front. A single person is not broken. A single person is not less. A single person is not less important or less valuable. A single person is not less useful to the Lord. A single person is, who is walking with Christ, is an effective and powerful minister who can go places and do things that a married person simply does not have the ability uh, to do. In other words, every bit as much as the church needs married people and families and children, and grandparents, the church needs single people who are willing to put their full and whole dedication into serving the Lord as such. We'll detail this as we go on, but I can't ever let a moment pass without saying it. Because we, like everybody, every other church, do care about our children and do do things that are meant to build them up. We do have various marriage uh, opportunities to work on your marriage and invest in your marriage because marriages are under attack. But I hope that we can, in saying this now, dispel any thought that we don't value single people or that singleness is some sort of a disease that needs to be cured or a problem that needs to be solved. Singleness is a wonderful estate. I'll stop repeating myself, and we'll move on to the gift of marriage. So this is uh, verses 2 through 6, which read as follows. 
Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over his own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. So he opens up his uh, defense of this as saying that it is because of sexual immorality. Um, and we want to note again, back to the context of this, what was, uh, what was Corinth's greatest problem, at least that we know of? Well, it was sexual immorality. This was a city, this was a place that was defined by sexual immorality, like Vegas today, right? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Yeah, of course, they meant your money, but they also meant all the immoral garbage you did when you were there, right? And so th this Corinth had a similar reputation, so much so, as we've mentioned in the past, that to Corinthianize something meant to be perverse about it, to be sexually immoral about it, to find the double entendre all the time, right? To find the secret uh, sexualization of it, or again, uh, perversion. So Paul, clearly seeing that this church that has existed in this culture, in this place where sexual immorality was less considered taboo and more considered something to brag about, was now helping them see that the direct or the correct application of God's design for a sexual relationship was the cure, was the answer, was the response that they needed to have to their hypersexualized culture. And ladies and gentlemen, if you think we're not in a hyper-sexualized culture, God bless you, you've figured out how to turn off your television and internet. But the truth of the matter is, is that no matter where you are, whether it's just uh, billboards or, or, or through, you know, internet ads on your YouTube site or whatever it is, sexualization of everything is pouring in through every available, you know, uh, uh, channel that the world can find. We live in a, much, a very similar culture that designs, desires and designs to legitimize and justify any kind of sexual expression. And here Paul is saying that it is all the more important in such a place or in such a society to not yield to the societal expectations or beliefs regarding sex, but rather to continue to go back to the Word of God and say this is the only correct usage of our sexual capacity or our sexual energy. This is the only correct satisfaction of that. This is the only correct expression of that, and everything else is wrong. We could go uh, on a, a rant that we won't go on about the incredible destructive power of accepting worldly ideas of sexuality that come through such disgusting means as as pornography or, or sexualization in television shows or the like, but we're just going to suffice it to say that they're all destructive and they keep people from enjoying the wonderful and beautiful thing that sex is meant to be in the context and privacy of a married Christian relationship. In other words, all of this hypersexualization we see in our culture is not doing anyone any good. It's not building anyone up. It's not making anyone stronger. It's not making anyone healthier. It's not making anyone's relationships better. It's not making anybody any less guilt-ridden before themselves or before the Lord. It is only bringing destruction. So might I encourage you, why bring it into your bedroom? Why let the world have any say in the world as to what a normal, good, or healthy sexual relationship is when God has given us more than enough information in Scripture as to know what that's meant to look like and what freedom we enjoy in that regard? So, in order to be ultimately explicit about this, and this is one of the, the insights that I mentioned that I never would have made before, Paul says very clearly, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Now, man and woman and wife and husband there are all the same word across. Man and woman, man and, sorry, man and husband, and wife and woman are the same. So really, if we're going to literally translate this, although this is uh, made to the point that marriage is meant to be involved, which certainly is part, exactly what Paul is saying, 
But what it really says, let each man have his own woman and each woman have her own man. Now, culturally and contextually, it does mean marriage. But what's my point here? Paul didn't say, let everyone have their own other person. He is expressly defining in a culture that had absolutely a profound acceptance of homosexuality, a statement that men are meant to be with women, women are meant to be with men, and there is no other uh, justified sexual relationship between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. You can argue whatever you want based on cultural means, but the Bible is absolutely and utterly clear on the matter. Homosexuality is not the design of God. It will never work out for the best of those participating in it, and God will never approve it as an action. And of course, we saw that in the last uh, chapter, wherein Paul, it, uh, chapter 6, verse 9, and continuing, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, or we might have effeminates. Essentially, what this is uh, saying by using two terms for this is essentially he is naming with graphic explicitness both the masculine and the effeminate in a homosexual relationship. So he's being very express and very clear, and it's not my desire to be gross or overly graphic, but only to say that anyone who would claim, as a recent uh, theological pub publication did, that the Bible does not have anything to say about the sin of homosexuality, don't be deceived. It has absolute clear direction on this. It doesn't dwell upon it, praise the Lord, just as it doesn't dwell upon any sin. It ultimately, in all sins, points us to lead, uh, leads us to trust in our Savior, Jesus Christ. However, we can't uh, make any argument about trying to justify these worldly relationships or trying to rework God's creation of marriage in order to include different relationships like a man and a man or a woman and a woman or a man and his dog or a man and two women or a woman and two men or anything like that or anyone who calls themselves non-binary. None of that fits in God's ultimate revelation and plan. And tragically, trying to pervert God's designs institution brings only pain and suffering on those who do it, both in the short term, but also ultimately and mostly because it draws them further and further away from their fellowship with God, which is the ultimate tragedy in the human life. So, uh, yeah, hopefully we point that out. Now he gets into the things that he requests or demands that each uh, husband and wife share together. He says, first of all, let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. So this is meant to be, or a marriage is meant to be a relationship of mutual affection. I don't believe that this is exclusively talking about a sexual relationship, but is actually uh, adjuring or, or, or exhorting us to make the choice. And this is an important point about reality that you may or may not know. You see, we live in such times of absolute comfort, and there's wonderful things about that. Many of us have never known a day of actual starvation unless we chose not to eat. And what that does is that makes it more difficult for us to understand how we control our feelings or the relationship between our will and our feelings. And so what Paul is saying here is that this is a choice that every husband and wife must make to show affection to their husband and wife, whether they feel like it or not, whether they feel like their spouse deserves that affection or not, whether they feel like their spouse wants that affection or not, is not the point. Everyone, whether you're the husband or the wife in the relationship, is meant to make an active choice to show affection, and yes, that includes physical intimacy, but isn't limited to within that relationship. And interestingly, as you'll find, if you do make that choice, that your feelings will often, sometimes over time, follow your actions. I uh, remember, uh, reminded of uh, Fiddler on the Roof, wherein after a, an arranged marriage of several years, Tevye and, and Golda are finally being kind of having their world rocked by their kids, choosing, wanting to choose to marry for love rather than as arranged marriages. And theirs had been arranged, and they never even thought about it. And so he asked, sings this wonderful song, Do You Love Me? And she describes all the ways in which they've worked together and survived together, and she served him and helped him, and he served her and helped her and led their family, and then finally go, wait a minute, if that's not love, what is? They found out that they had a deeper more lasting, righteous, loving marriage because they chose to love each other than, in, uh, in fact, 
their children would have right off the bat based upon just bowing to their feelings. Your feelings follow your faith. If you try to make your feelings run the relationship and wait to feel like showing affection for your spouse, it's going to be some long, quiet, angry nights. Next, we have mutual authority. It says the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Okay, this makes sense. If we were to stop here in, a, in, a, in our belief that, there's a, you know, that the Bible is super sexist, then this would make sense. But it goes on. It says, but, uh, and the likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Can we just, anybody who thinks that the Bible denigrates women or is sexist, please stand up so we can mock you relentlessly? You need to understand that this argument is inevitably one of the stupidest satanic attacks that has ever been made. I challenge you, and I have, go to cultures that have not been heavily influenced or profoundly influenced by Christianity and find out who it is that is attracted to the church. It's not the man. Pagan cultures inevitably treat women like chattel, like property, things to be used. And men are allowed to do whatever they want, but absolute fidelity is demanded of the women. In a pagan culture, this, uh, this fidelity and this abuse is natural. But what does the Bible do? It brings husbands and wives into this new realization of the importance of marriage, and that is a mutual authority over one another. Such that... If a man or a woman was in any way solicited to be involved in something inappropriate, the only responsible or, uh, reasonable response would be, well, actually, this isn't mine. This body is, is, is property of April, so you'll have to ask her first, but I have to tell you what her answer is going to be ahead of time, right? That mutual authority, that mutual control is something unseen in the ancient world and yet shows the incredible elevation of both men and women and the importance of that marriage relationship and the commitment you made, not just to have fun and get you know, the, the, the best experience out of life, but because, uh, to glorify God by living in this way, that you know that they're one members of one another. So, um, husbands and wives are both to think of their bodies not as their own, but rather under the authority and obligation to their spouse. This both has a, a sense, or a, a sense in terms of marital fidelity, as well as displaying the new commitment that is meant to exist within a marriage. So a mutual authority is meant to be exercised, which is difficult for all of us. I wouldn't even say it's more natural to one than the other, but to mention that, that as a married person, you are owned by your spouse. And what you do with their body, your body affects them, of course, but is also very much their business. There's no privacy uh, to be had there in that regard. This is God's design for marriage, and it involves right, a, a, a mutual submission in that regard and recognizing that what you do... And by the way, what is the extension of that, right? What is, if that is accurately applied in the realm of our sexual relationships, how far does that go in terms of our desire to serve and care for and love one another in a sacrificial manner? Of course it does. And then it moves on, he moves on to the principle of mutual involvement. He said, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and to prayer and to come together so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So husbands and wives are here not to deprive one another. And again, without being overly graphic, we, can, we will say and move on quickly with a, a good Protestant blush that frequency is not dictated by Scripture, but regularity is required. It's a blessed thing that the Lord leaves a lot of space for our discussion because that means that different couples can decide or figure out what is needed within the privacy and context of their own relationship. However, again, it is absolutely clear that some degree of regularity is absolutely required for a healthy relationship. There will be situations, tragically, where health concerns make it impossible or some other difficulties make it impossible, and that does not allow anybody any outs or frees or cheap cards or any cheat cards or anything else like that. 
and is disgusting and worldly. Sometimes life comes rough and you just got to roll with the punches, whether that's, again, a, a health situation, an emotional depression situation, something that might uh, upset the regular order. But what Paul's giving is the expectation, what we're meant to strive for, we might say, within the context of that. And as we find that even if that regular uh, involvement, regular activity seems somewhat obligated or seems somewhat um, robotic and not, you know, just, hey, Wednesday night or it's Thursday night, it still will increase intimacy within the marriage union. In fact, to the point that it might be worth both parties staying up a little later than is natural in order to continue to show that physical expression of your dedication and union together before falling quickly to sleep. There is a value, and I don't uh, want to be controversial or taboo or raise eyebrows in terms of the things we're talking about in church, but it is the only loving thing that we can say to make it known that that part of your relationship is important, even when it takes discipline, even when you have to go out of your way to, uh, to, to invest your time in that. It's meaningful not just to one party or the other, and it's quite interesting to look down through history and read different treatises over time as to which party is the more um, sexually voracious. At different points in time, men have been known or, or thought of as the uh, uns unsatisfiable people who want that all the time, and, and at other times women have, I think usually based on something about who has the power in the situation. So basically, whoever has the, the cultural onus to say yes, then the other person's going to be perceived as constantly wanting it. Um, that's social science stuff that's totally meaningless to you, so I'm sorry for bringing it up. But the point is, is that whether or not you're on the, uh, the, the want it side or you're on the wait for it side, you need to both work together and come to an idea of some regular uh, intimacy together if you want to have a healthy, godly marriage relationship. Then he goes on to say that this is not a command, but a concession. And we can read this in such a way that suggests that, like, just because you're such wimps, I'm putting up on this. But we have to, again, recognize the world in which Paul is coming from. You see, in the Jewish world, the expectation was that every young boy or every young girl would be married, often by 12 to 14 years old, right? And so marriage, in fact, the uh, commandment to be fruitful and multiply through marriage and having children was one of the 613 commands that the Jews tried to keep and honor. So you were sinning by not getting together, not getting married, by not having kids, at least in general terms. In fact, this same uh, legalistic attitude has been brought across into the church. I a, was uh, on a walk with a dear friend recently, and they go to a church that's very legalistic and, and, and really wrong thinking in a lot of their theology. And uh, at one point, the pastor's wife asked, they're married, but they don't plan to have kids. I said, when are you going to have kids? Kids. She said, well, we, we, just, we don't feel called to do that. That's not where we're headed. And she said the lady was speechless and basically walked away from the conversation because everyone's supposed to have kids. That's what you're supposed to do. That's where value comes from. That's what God says. That, bah, 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 bah. That's dead wrong. That is not where value comes from. That legalism is absolutely misplaced, but it, is, it was certainly present in Jewish times. So what's Paul pointing out? Why is this a concession, not a commandment? Because it is not God's design that every single person be married. It's not God's design that any person be married for their entire life, right? There's going to be uh, points of singleness on any, any even, even the most successful marriage. There's singleness before it, right? So his clarification here, I think, is mostly a response to the possibility of the legalist saying, essentially, everybody's got to get married. And he's... he's backing this up and, and backing up to point out this absolute need to say that singleness is, in, is, is also a way a person can glorify the Lord. It is not a commandment. It is not a law. It is not an expectation of God that every person will marry. And so I believe that that's why this is characterized as such, as saying I don't make this a commandment but as a concession because Paul had lived in a world where it was a commandment most of his life and probably taught it as such. All right, let's look at our final section, the gift of singleness, verses 7 through 10, 9, 7 through 9. For I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. 
But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So now we get Paul's personal desire. And whenever Paul is expressing his personal thoughts, he makes it clear. However, we have to recognize that it is still kept in God's Word. God is omnipotent. And if he wanted to blast out a few words from this letter before enshrining it in Scripture, he certainly could do so, but he chose not to. First of all, we want to note that people can lose a spouse at any age, right? A person could become single at any age. We don't know whether Paul was married and perhaps his wife died, or as we'll see, perhaps sent him away. We, again, we just have a lack of information in, in that category, but we do know that a person might become single at any time in life. And we want to put forth exactly what Paul is putting forth here, is the incredible ministry that a single person can have. And boy, isn't this just the enemy's way. You take a person who is made free to give of themselves most sacrificially, to care for others with the greatest of their time, to give the best of their energy to either building up the church or reaching out with the gospel, serving and helping others, and you try to damage them by telling them, no, 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 you need someone else. You need, to get, you need to get married. You need to be dating. You need to be, you need to be, and work us up into this you're not enough alone with God attitude so that you can be basically put out of commission in order to, having, uh, in order to keep them from having a powerful and effective ministry. But make no mistake, the single person has a freedom that married people don't have. The single person has an opportunity to make sacrifices, to do things and serve the Lord in ways that a married person simply has to say, I can't do that. I have to take care of my wife. I can't do that. I have to prioritize my kids. And the single person can be up all night. In fact, at Camp Arete, we gave a very similar message to this because this point appears in Scripture frequently. But <clears throat> you got to give a very similar one, and one of the uh, one of the gals who's a counselor in her, in her 40s who'd been sim- single her whole life came to me just with a tear-stained face and said, no one ever told me that it was okay to be single. And I felt every single day in, a, in my life in the church that women looked at me with suspicion, that men looked at me as if I was some sort of loose cannon on deck. And I've lived my entire life feeling like in some way I was expected or uh, expected to be, you know, looking for or finding a husband in everything that I do. And that's not where the Lord's called me. That's not where I mean, uh, I, the Lord has used her. So it was a powerful and important moment for me to remember that so few people in the church, in the body of Christ, will hear this message. So please, again, hear it now. Whether you are a widow or a widower, whether you are just simply not married yet or you are, have never been married, whether you're a divorcee, and we'll talk a lot about that on, uh, next week and about the nature of that, um, but whatever state you're in, and particularly in the state of singleness, Paul's desire is for single people to, uh, to, to enjoy the freedom that they have and also the risks that they can take. A married person going to a dangerous place to share the gospel takes risks in which wondering what, whether what it would be like for their, par- their children to grow up or their wife to go on or their husband to go on without them. But a single person can look at that with all courage and honesty and say, well, of course, everyone would be missed, that they don't take the same risks in terms of the number of people and the way in which people depend upon them. Depend upon them. Furthermore, a a parent has to look after their own children and their obligation to their own children, and that means that children without a parent in the church or without, or children, orphans altogether, need someone like with the capacities of the single person to care and be a father figure and stand in for the Lord for them. Paul's desire is that single people would know that they're not broken but they're actually potentially at the very peak of their ability to serve the Lord. 
Paul, however, also is very um, balanced in this advice. He says the best, uh, he's looking for the best life for a widow or a widower is to serve the Lord. But in 1 Timothy 5, 14, he says, therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, and give no opportunity for the adversary to speak reproachably. So again, what we have is an individualized situation. For some person, they're going to come into their singleness and uh, know that they have an increased ability to glorify the Lord. And for another person, they are going to burn with the desire to be with someone. And that, that is not an ungodly thing to do, not an ungodly thing to seek. But you got to weigh the options, right? And so Paul's options here, are you going to uh, be able to live and serve the Lord in, in your singleness? Or are you going to just burn up with, with passion and desire and your loneliness and everything? In which case, get married, get it over with, and, and, and then get into a good relationship that's going to bring you uh, into that place. But we do, will point out that marriage is a serious thing in the Bible, and we should understand it so much so that when Jesus explained to the disciples his, or God's expectation about the nature of divorce and, and how unacceptable it is to him, his disciples said, if such is the case for a man, or sorry, if such is the case of the man and his wife, it is better not to marry. Now, this is a very funny passage to me in a sort of a sad way. Because in Jewish culture at the time, men had most of the cards, held most of the cards. A husband could send his wife away for burning dinner or for doing, you know, just displeasing him generally, get being in a bad mood once too often or whatever. A woman didn't have that ability. And so when Jesus comes along and says there's only this select few potential uh, causes for a divorce, or at least justifiable reasons for a divorce being infidelity, denial of affection, or um, abandonment, I think. Anyway, we'll get to that next week. Uh, he's going to limit it just to that. The guys are like, wait a minute. You just took our huge manipulation power card in this thing. It's probably better not to get married at all. I just think that's hilarious <laughs> that they were so stupid and honest. Uh, Jesus says, all cannot accept this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who are born from their mother's womb, there are eunuchs who are made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who are made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. For he who is able to accept it, let him accept it. So he points out that there are three classes. There are those who are born for whatever reason, be that medical or emotional, in a place that they just don't need another person around, and they can be totally whole and totally happy serving the Lord in their singleness, and that's great. Other people are, for some reason or method, could have been something external abusive. It could have been, and this is shocking to us, but people who are made separated from their sexual capacity in order to maintain some other kind of service, which again, because we don't live on the edge of starving to death, most of us, that seems like an unreasonable sacrifice. But if you're talking about the potential of starving to death or just giving up this one aspect of your life in order to have a good job and a position, it seems more reasonable from the, the perspective. We could argue that has many applications. Um, but finally, the person who's committed themselves wholly to God and to His glory right? That's the one who's made themselves a eunuch, and this is no physical operation they're talking about. This is an emotional, spiritual commitment, uh, is committed to his glory, but not everyone's able to accept it. So God knows how we're built. He knows how we're designed, and he knows that not everybody has that calling. But if you're single, ask God if you have that calling. If you become single, if you lose your spouse, ask God, is this your calling? It is a noble and high calling. It's a good thing. Singleness is a good thing in the body of Christ, in the world, and in God's plan. So in conclusion, marriage matters. Whether you are married or you're not, these are important relationships, and they have a design in glorifying God and keeping His plan, and it is the job of the church to support marriages and to support those who are married. And if you are in a marriage that is struggling, seek help today. Seek help today yesterday. Let's talk about it. Let's look at Scripture. Let's pray about it. Let's grow, help you grow and support your marriage. If you are single, please do not accept the world or even some of churchianity's assessments that you need to get that fixed in order to glorify God, but rather go about it in a way that seeks to know and glorify Him and trust in what He has for you in that time, and know always that God is able to be glorified in your life no matter what's going on, what situation, what direction you're heading. 
And ultimately, if you're finding your satisfaction in Him, then everything else at least has the opportunity to be in right relationship to that. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the great gift of your love, of your life, of your word, of your work for us on behalf of your Son, Jesus Christ, or from your Son, Jesus Christ, on our behalf. Please, O oh Lord, bring us to a place of understanding that our marriages are not about us, that they are about glorifying you and bringing you glory within those relationships. I praise you and I thank you for every single person in our church for whatever reason they may be single, for the capacity that that opens up for them to grow in the grace and knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ, to serve with ultimate freedom and the ability to bring you glory in, their, in their, uh, the details of their lives. And I pray that they would take that assignment with all seriousness and that the church would support them in their singleness every bit as much as it would support the, the uh, marrieds in their marriage relationships. Lord, we long to bring you glory. We long to make you known on this earth. And Father, this issue of sexual, sexual morality and of relationships and marriages and of the power of a ministry as a single person, we're all a part of that. Might we so take it seriously that we would bring you glory within and throughout it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.